All right. Could we stand together? We're, uh, we're in Galatians doing a series called Freedom Fighters. We have a memory verse. We're all doing it together. And so Galatians 5, 1, could we say this together? It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Could we just pray? <clears throat> Lord, the enemy is very good at what he does. And our freedom in Christ is key to our joy in Christ, which is our strength. And so, God, there are so many things that try to take away the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray today that you would speak. I pray for every single heart here that you would establish us in the gospel. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have a Bible with you, turn to Galatians chapter 2. The title of the message is Freedom Fighters, Dangers to Our Freedom, Part 1. I was working on this message this week and I realized on Wednesday this was not one message. It was two messages. And so we're going to get the first two points today and then point three will be next week or actually in two weeks. All right. Galatians 2, verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, uh, Cephas is another name for Peter, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles, and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we who have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who live in me, lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Very troubling scripture. Troubling in this. Peter's the main guy. Peter, Peter is the rock. Peter has been given the keys to the kingdom. How can a good guy fall back into bad doctrine? How can a good guy, and, and Paul says, even Barnabas went back to eating with the Jews and Paul has to confront them openly and rebuke him openly. And it wasn't like Paul's, Paul versus Peter or Paul thinking he's more anointed than Peter. It's none of that. The reason why he's confronting him 
is that it's not Paul versus Peter. It's the gospel versus Peter. And Paul has already said, I'm not, I'm not above going into error. He said in, in Galatians 1.8, he said, if I or an angel from heaven come preaching another gospel, let him be condemned. The gospel transcends human beings, human opinions, and really the book of Galatians is about, it's fighting for the gospel that frees us. Good men can teach wrong things. I want to give you three dangers the American church faces today. We're going to do two of them today. And we'll do one next week. I was in a church once that every week it was something about why what our church believed was better than what other churches believed in. I just, I just so disliked it that I try to never talk about what's wrong with somewhere else. Let's just, let's just do what, what is right. But today, we, this is our text, and we're going we're gonna to go there, and, and please know that if, if good people can start teaching the wrong thing, then I could start teaching the wrong thing. That's why Paul said about the Bereans that they were wiser than the Thessalonians because after Paul preached, they went back to see if this was so. They checked the scriptures themselves. We need to be committed to the word of God. All right. I want to talk about first additions to the gospel. What's the big deal? Peter and Barnabas are starting to eat with the Jews, are starting to separate themselves from the Gentiles at meals. What is the big deal? Why is this this incredibly important, I need to confront you publicly issue? Here's why. The reason why they were going with the Jews is because under the law, Jews had to eat separate from Gentiles. They had to create separation. Well, the problem is, is if you're obeying that, and, it, and you're, in, you're in Christ, but now you're going back to law, how much of the law do we now have to obey? Whenever you add something to the gospel, two things happen. One, you create division. If you add something, then the only people that are in your group are people that believe the addition with you and, and you have to be separate from the rest of the body of Christ. The second thing it, it introduces is bondage. When Paul says, stand firm in your freedom therefore and do not become enslaved again to a yoke of bondage, the bondage he is speaking of is going back to performance-oriented, earning it Christianity, where you go back and you're trying to earn it by good works, by keeping the law. Whenever you add something to the gospel, it's like leaven. You will pretty soon, if, once you add one thing, you got, you're, you're saved through Christ and you got to do this. It's like leaven. Pretty soon it'll be not just this, but you got to do this, 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 you got to do this. And pretty soon you're completely wrapped up in man's performance instead of God's grace. Paul says this in Galatians 2, 21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. If this is still about us performing, us being good enough, Jesus died in vain. Romans eleven six. 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Either God freely justifies us by his grace when we come to Christ, or he doesn't. And if he doesn't, if it's grace... Plus, 
it, yes, God got us started through dying on the cross, and God got us started by, by giving us a little help with the Holy Spirit, but now it's about us performing. It's no longer grace. It's, it's, it still works. I was in college. I had got saved. I was so excited about being saved, and and then I found out that my next door neighbor back home, he was one of my good friends, he got saved too. He was going to a different church than I was, but I was so excited that he had come to Christ and I went to a retreat with his church. And it was a little odd because at this retreat, the worship, which was beautiful worship, but there was no musical, no musical instruments. They didn't believe in musical instruments. Okay. Cool. We had a great retreat, and I thought we had great fellowship. And but I noticed that he kept he kept grabbing me aside and taking me into his Bible and showing me these verses on water baptism and and again and again and again and and I'm like, yeah, I, I know what you believe about water baptism, bro but I don't believe it the way you believe it. I love Jesus. I'm in Christ, but I don't believe water baptism the way your group believes about water baptism. They believe you weren't saved unless you were water baptized and you need to be water baptized in Jesus' name only. And it was, it was very specific of how you needed to get baptized and and I'm like, okay, you know, we agree to disagree. No big deal. Well, that wa it wasn't okay. I, I would go out preaching on the mall, telling sinners about Christ, and my friend spent his time trying to convince me about his opinion about water baptism. I'm like, dude, do you not think that I'm saved? Because I don't agree with what, and it, it came down to, no, he didn't believe I was saved. Because you have to believe it. I'm like, I have been baptized in Jesus' name. Yeah, but that wasn't enough. You needed to be baptized just in Jesus' name. And it turned out you really had to go to their church. <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is you need to come to our church. Because we're right and everyone else is wrong. It was years later that he, he had gotten higher and higher in the leadership and at some point the, the weight of all the rules they had to keep became so great that he just exploded and he got together with me and he didn't know what, what to believe about anything. And I, I did my, my best to say it's, it's about Jesus. Jesus is real. There was a lot of stuff added to it but Jesus is real. When you become born again, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. Every single believer has the Holy Spirit. Every believer has been baptized into Christ. Water baptism is an outward picture of that inward identification with Christ. Water baptism is very important. We're having another one. I, we've talked about it's important to publicly confess Christ. But water baptism is not necessary for salvation. The thief on the cross was never water baptized. You are saved through Christ Jesus and his death on the cross. Add nothing. <laughs> Some people add some groups add speaking in tongues. God gave the Holy Spirit as an empowering force to be a witness. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is, is an empowerment to be a witness to others, there is a prayer language that is available to all believers. It has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. It is an empowerment. No, God's not going to make anybody speak in tongues. 
It's simply, it's a, it's a language available to believers as an empowerment for witness. But there are some groups in the body of Christ, and once again, they, they've got, they could take you through here and find every verse of why everybody's wrong except for them, and you do not have the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues, and therefore you are not saved unless you speak in tongues, and therefore it creates tremendous fear that I have to perform. Now, it's interesting. Just because you do speak in tongues does not mean that they can fellowship with you. Because you have to believe speaking in tongues is necessary before you can fully fellowship. I mean, it just, it gets, it, whenever you add something to the gospel, it causes you to be divided from the rest of the body of Christ. And it leads you into bondage. Because once you add one thing, the Bible says a little leaven, watch out, Jesus said, for the leaven of the Pharisees. Once you add one thing, you're going to start adding other things. And pretty soon you have to tithe, and you have to do this, and you have to go here, and you have to do this. And it becomes bondage instead of freedom. One other overt addition to the gospel is uh, the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was part of the ceremonial law that Colossians 2.16 says was fulfilled in Christ. Christ is our Sabbath. We rest in Christ. Salvation is in Christ who has become our Sabbath. In the Old Testament, they rested on a day. In the New Testament, we rest in a person. Jesus Christ is the Sabbath of the New Testament. But if you, if you teach that the Sabbath is part of the moral law, not the ceremonial law, then the, then the Sabbath is still in effect today, then that means true worship happens on Saturday, not on Sunday, and that if you don't keep the Sabbath, you are a Sabbath breaker, and we can't fellowship with you. So we've got our own group over here that does it the way that pleases God. And we've got all these other people here. We pray for their dear souls because they're disobeying God in regards to the Sabbath day. It divides us. And then once again, it leads to bondage. Once you add that, okay, how many, how many of the rules on the Sabbath do you keep then? I mean, there's a thousand rules on the Sabbath. If you're going to do it, Old Testament, how many of those rules do you keep? You go back into bondage. There are subtle additions as well to the gospel. I'll just mention two of them. One is food. Where what is wrong with America, what's wrong with humanity is white sugar and white flour. And the answer for America, of course, is to eat right and drink right and forsake all of these other bad foods. And that's, now you will, now you will find joy, now you will find peace, now your life will be good. I really appreciate people that are eating right and trying to eat right and trying to educate all of us in eating better. But folks, we need to be very, very careful because Romans 14, 17 says that the kingdom of God is not about food or drink. It is about righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God, wh whether you eat this or eat that, is not, that's not a big deal. That's just going into your stomach. And then coming out again. The kingdom of God is not about food and drink. And I've, I've noticed how the enemy gets people obsessing about food. Sometimes the eating disorders are because you're just focusing on food too much. And people want to get free from it. And it's funny because when I get to pray for them, I'll say, here's the biggest problem. You're thinking about food too much. It's not a big deal. This is about, this is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
How do you, if, if, if food has become an idol and you've looked to food for your comfort and so you've got an eating addiction, how do you get free from that? Interestingly enough, it's not by focusing on food. It's by focusing on Jesus. Isn't the enemy subtle? 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. Some forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. We had this lady come from Kansas City and speak at our church when we were in Montevideo. She came more than once. I, I will never forget her praying over food because whatever we were eating, she would pray for it and God help us to not gain weight from this food. <laughs> Thank you, God, for this food. Thank you for what we're about to eat. Help us not gain weight from it in Jesus' name. I, and I don't, I'm not sure if that's a legal prayer or not. Um, <laughs> Subtle additions. Second one is certainly politics. Passionate about politics. Christians have to be Republicans because obviously God, God is a Republican because God is, God is against abortion and Republicans are against abortion and therefore if you're really a Christian, you're a Republican. And the only problem is that, with that, is, is when you talk to a Democrat and they say, surely God is a Democrat. Because the Democrats are for the poor and for the oppressed and for people's rights. And God, all the way through the Bible, for every verse for, against abortion, there's a hundred for the poor. And so God must be a Democrat. And with great passion. People can say, the problem with America and the key to making America better is to have less government. The whole problem is we've got too much government, and if we would just give more freedom, then um, everything would be fine. And other people with equal passion, the problem with America is there's not enough government. If we had more government, if we... If we distributed all of the goods better, then we would be happy as a country. Guys, and I'm, trust me, I love America, I love democracy, you vote however you want to vote. I, I think people should be involved in the political system. We're, we're a democracy. But please don't think that the answer for America is Republican or Democrat. The answer for America is Jesus. <laughs> civil government, the perfect civil government, which they had in the Old Testament. The only, the only goal that it can achieve, even if it's absolutely perfect, is to restrain evil. Civil government has been given the sword by God to restrain evil. There is no redemption through civil government. It's not even intended to do that. It was given by God, Romans 13, 1 through 4, for the purpose of restraining evil. That's all civil government can do. The church has been given the keys to redeem. Only the church can change people. Our troops going over and destroying ISIS... Let's say we totally destroyed ISIS. Let's say we totally destroyed Al-Qaeda. That would be a victory for civil government. But that would not be a victory for the kingdom of God. Pastor Tom, how, how, would, how would you get a victory in the kingdom of God? Instead of killing them, converting them. Instead of, instead of sending bombs, Jesus appears to them in their dreams and they get saved and they repent willingly. Do you see why we need to pray? Why the heart of the church has to be prayer?
Well, what's this got to do with our freedom? This has everything to do with our freedom. If you start adding things to Christianity, if you start putting your identity in something other than Jesus Christ and him crucified and his love and his delight in you, and you start adding things you do or positions you hold or, or you're, you're going into a road called bondage. Colossians 2, 20 through 23. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Whenever you add something to the gospel, and we, we do this, and true Christians do this, and do this, and do this, and we don't do this, don't do this, it always appears wise to add rules. It always appears to be more holy if you're doing more and performing more and requiring more. But the Bible says that it, you, it actually has no value in actually walking free from the sin nature. It's self-made religion. It appeals to pride, the pride of humanity. And in all of these groups that we've talked about, it's not that they're bad people. Good people can start teaching the wrong thing. Peter and Barnabas were good people that got going the wrong way, and Paul openly rebuked them. Why? Because the gospel was at stake. Here it is, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Add nothing. There it is. <laughs> wow. In Christ, we have eternal life. Add nothing. Secondly, changing the gospel. Second danger to the, our freedom. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The gospel invites us to die to ourselves, to our own effort to save ourselves, to our own plan for our life, and to find our life in Jesus Christ. The Father, God the Father, has ordained before the foundation of the world that the hero of humanity would be Jesus Christ. The gospel is about Jesus. It's about his glory. He, we were created by him, Colossians says, and we were created for him. <coughs> There's another gospel in America today. And I call this heresy by emphasis. Heresy by emphasis simply means this. You and I do not have permission to take out certain truths and make our own gospel around it while ignoring certain other truths. This last week, I was t chatting with one of my pastor friends on the phone, and he, he told me what, what somebody had said from their pulpit. It was actually the pastor's wife with the pastor standing right next to him. And the troubling thing is this is one of the largest evangelical, evangelical churches in America. And he told me what she had said and the response of the crowd afterwards. And I was just like... It, please tell me that, that that didn't happen. He said, you can go on YouTube and see it. 
So I try, I try not to watch Christian TV. <laughs> because I just get so sad with things that are done in the name of Jesus and the way people raise money. And I don't like having a critical spirit. I don't like having, it just, it, it, it makes me so upset. And I know there's good stuff on there. There's just bad stuff on there too. So I'm just, to protect myself, I try to watch as little as I can of anything. So I go to the YouTube and here it is. This is, these are direct quotes. Pastor's wife standing here, pastor right next to her. When we obey God, we're not doing it for God. We're doing it for ourselves. When you worship him, you're not really doing it for God. You're doing it for yourself. Because when you're happy, God's happy. There are legitimate promises in this word around God's provision for us and around God's healing, his desire and will to heal us. But you cannot pull those out and neglect the truths that are all over this Bible about God's purposes in suffering and about God's sovereignty. And so what people are doing in this country is just taking what they like and saying, this is the Bible. And unfortunately, most people don't know the whole Bible. And so it's easy to be led astray. Listen to what it says in 2 Timothy, where Paul warns us about these days. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Freedom and truth go together. The idea that we can just use God for... Here, here's why this is wrong. Here's why this theology is wrong. It makes God the means to our happiness. God exists and the gospel exists not for his glory, but for our happiness. Now we all know the truth that in his glory, God also wants us to find joy and happiness. That's so true. But you can't make God the means to our happiness. The idea that we just need to envision our lives and we can, whatever we can envision, and then we just speak it forth and things will come into being because we created them. Guys, that's, that's not scripture. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God's in charge, not us. Is there power in speaking? Yes, if God told you to speak it, yes, there is. If from intimacy with God, God tells you to speak to that mountain, you, and you speak to that mountain and God told you to, then it's powerful. But if it's you just making stuff up, it's empty. They're idle words. God wants us to be free. The greatest bondage, it turns out, is self. To know true freedom is to be crucified with Christ, to identify with his crucifixion, to lose the power of self to run its own thing, and to enter into Christ's life. I uh, <coughs> had my uh, favorite preacher. I listen to every tape. This guy, this is, that dates me, doesn't it? I listen to every tape this guy had made. I would go to bed listening to tapes by him. It's all I could talk about. I was so excited. I read every book that he had written. And then 
as I'm reading the Bible, I realize I, I don't, I think he's off in this one area. And my personality is it's got to be all or nothing. You know, I either completely reject him and every experience he's ever had, or I completely accept him and I'm just, I'm just so stressed out about this because I believe scripturally he's wrong in this one area and I'm bringing it before God. God, what, what do I do with this? And the scripture comes to me from 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says, we all know in part. Then we will know fully, even as we are fully known. It's okay that everybody doesn't have everything. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean they're off on everything. You can receive some truth and just realize that isn't, that's not quite right. If that wasn't the case, I'd hate for you to be coming and hearing me. <laughs> Seriously, because I know in part. Then I'll know fully, even as I'm fully known. This is why we all need to cling to Jesus and not to our favorite preacher. Yeah. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. Folks, there are things, there are promises that have been given to us and they belong to us. And it is, we should believe them, we should pray them, we should confess them, we should stand on them. They are our inheritance. But we're not running the show. And there are some things that even as you're standing and you're believing and you thought it would go this way, and it didn't go that way, it went this way. And you have no idea why it went the wrong way. You have no idea. When you prayed this way and you believed this way and you had this promise, why did it go that way? That's called a secret thing. That's called something you don't get to know on this side. Does that mean Jesus doesn't love you? No. Does that mean he's not faithful? No. That means you don't know yet. That means I don't know yet. It's a secret thing. It belongs to the Lord. One day we're going to see everything. And the Bible says in Revelation 19 that in that day we will say, all your ways were true. When we see it from his side, we will say, you are faithful and true. You are, you are stunningly amazing. But we're not in that day yet, are we? So right now, we're, we're, we're slugging through this thing. We're trying to believe. We're trying to grab promises. But we also need to rest in the sovereignty of God. Amen. The true gospel must include us going to the cross, not just Jesus. Mark 8, 34 and 35. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. <clears throat> so Jesus went to the cross for us, he died in our place, substitutionary, him for us, and in that we just receive it. But Jesus also went to the cross as an example that we would not cling to our lives, but that we would give him our lives, that we would lay down our lives. 20 years ago now, it, well, I, we were in Faustin, Minnesota, was pastoring a church up there, a fellowship church. And I had a vivid dream. And in this dream, I had died. I had physically died and was raised from the dead. And I was living with my mom. I had this little 
apartment in my old bedroom that I grew up in. And I was living with my mom. And I had no job. All I did was tell people, people would come from all over the place to hear the story of how I was raised from the dead. That was the whole dream. Wow. And I woke up and I'm like, that, that, is, that is so odd. <laughs> but I want you to think for just a moment about the Christian life. If we are dead in Christ, and the life we live, we live by faith in the Son of God. It means we don't, we don't own anything. It means we don't have any position. It means we don't have any family. It means everything else we, we hold just like this. Our life is in Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is real freedom. In that dream, every other tie, every other thing that I had in my life was gone. All I had was a testimony that I had been dead and was now alive from the dead, and I had a story to tell. And what God wants for each one of us, it's okay to have stuff and to have positions and to have family and to have all of these other things. It, God, God made all of those things, but he doesn't want any of those things to have us to tie us, to control us. He wants us to be free. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm, therefore, in that freedom. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up and our communion servers, if they wouldn't mind coming down, we're going to have communion together. I asked Brian this week if he would learn a new song and teach it to us. And we will, we will do it again here. But here are the verses. You laid your life down on the altar. This is Jesus dying on the cross for us. You endured hostility. You drank the cup of the Father. The Bible says in Psalm 75 that the, the cup of the wrath of God against sin was, was mixed and filled. And Jesus drank that cup. The wrath of God against all of our sins, he drank for us. When I was still your enemy. When I was far away, you called me. When I was broken in my sin, you brought your spirit upon me and put a new heart within. Oh, may my life burn as an offering that is pleasing unto thee. I'll count it joy to share your suffering that your life may flow from me. Would you pray with me as the servers come? We have, an, we have an open communion here, which means you don't have to belong to this church as long as you love Jesus. What we do ask is that everybody hold the emblems until we've all been served. It's a prophetic word we received this morning. If you are suffering from depression or loneliness, know this. I have come to set you free. Who the Son sets free 
is free indeed. You are being set free today so you can go out and free others. Go and do as I tell you. As you step out in faith, you will become strong in me. Joy will burst out in your life. Testimonies will rise up to bring glory to my name. Colossians 1, verse 21. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. The night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. He said, this is my body given for you. Could we pray together? for the bread. Lord, you had to become a human being. Your fleshly body had to be given as a sacrifice so that we could be cleansed, so that we could, just by putting our faith in you and in your sacrifice, that we could become blameless before God right now without reproach before God right now. Wow. You gave yourself for me. You, Jesus, you have reconciled us to God. Jesus had taken, eat. Let's eat together. When the supper was ended, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which will be poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Could we pray for the cup? Lord, we thank you for forgiveness today. We thank you, Jesus, that you gave your blood to wash us, to give us a new beginning in you. Lord, today we give you everything that's been wrong with us, everything that's been self-centered instead of Christ-centered. Lord, we, we identify today with your cross. And individually and corporately, Lord, we affirm that you love me and gave yourself on that cross for me. Wow. We receive that new beginning from your grace right now. Jesus said, take and drink. Could we drink together? Could we stand together? So, Lord, we offer up to you right now all of our suffering here today, God. Everything we haven't been able to control, every prayer that has seemingly gone unanswered. And we say, Jesus, we don't need to understand everything. Would you remove the weight? of our confusion? Would you remove the weight, God, of our even theology? God, would you give each one here 
that peace which passes all understanding. That we don't need to know everything to know you. To know Christ and him crucified and that we are his beloved children. Sometimes, Lord, when it's the time we need to come closest, we go farthest away. We're coming close today, Jesus. Bless your children. We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have some teams up here, guys, if you want more prayer. Have a great day and a great week. Bless you.